Well, the patrons have voted, and this time they've decided on something that's actually a bit more familiar to all of us, and that's Anika Nycteris. And it's familiar because it's one of the very first bats that we found in the fossil record. The bats are actually super diverse. There's over 1,400 species still around today, and they're very, very diverse with many different kinds of lifestyles, including some of the ones that eat more fruits, and then the other ones which fly around and eat bugs on the wing, or potentially even frogs and sometimes fish. They're very, very diverse in what they do. And how do they get their starts? Well, Anika nycteris can actually help us understand that, and it can also help us understand what better it was, because it does fit into one of the two major groups of bats. So to start with, we need to understand where Anika nycteris comes from, and it comes from the Green River Formation which occupies states like Wyoming, Utah, and Colorado in North America. And the depositional environment that this formation represents are a series of very large lakes, and I mean incredibly, incredibly large lakes that were far different from anything found in the region today. When the Green River Formation was deposited about 50 million years ago, the environment was far different from anything we see in this part of North America today. And while the continents were slightly more south, that position alone can account for that. And that's because the Green River Formation was entirely different from the modern day ecosystems we see in this part of North America. There were crocodilians in these lakes, as well as stingrays, and in the forest there would have been very small early horses, barely as high as your knee, moving in and among the sycamore trees and the palm trees that were characteristic of the Green River Formation. But you need to understand, this environment is entirely different from what we expect of the kind of dry grassland prairies that we see in these parts of these states today. And within all of this was the Green River Formation Lakes, and they did an incredible job at preserving some fossils. And the most famous of these come from Fossil Butte, and that includes Fossil Butte National Monument, where it was named specifically because of the fossils that do come from this area. And these are mostly fish, however, as I mentioned and alluded to earlier, you can find some early horse relatives, as well as crocodilians in this. And occasionally you find something really spectacular, like a bat. And on the subject of the very good fossils coming from this formation, we can look at the holotype of Onyx nycteris, which is the one that they used to try to find the entire species and what traits we should look for in this species to apply to other fossils that are found. And this fossil is almost entirely complete. And while it does appear it doesn't have a skull, the skull is still preserved, and I will mention that in a little bit. But first we need to understand how these fossils are found in the Green River Formation. Because while there's some areas like Fossil Butte National Monument where it's legally protected and the fossils that are found there do go into research institutions, the Green River Formation is pretty big and it occupies some spaces that are on private land. And depending on which state it's in, people can go out to these locations, find their own fossils, and then sell them to whoever they want. I even have a fossil fish from the Green River Formation that I've been meaning to prepare out of the rock for honestly a couple of years now. Just one of those things that's been on the back burner for a while. But this is a pretty common occurrence. There are fish that you can buy from there where you yourself have to prep it out of the rock, or you can buy pre-prepared fossils from the rock. And this includes things like large crocodilians if you have a lot of money, but also a lot of very small fish and potentially even some of those palm fronds from those palm trees I mentioned earlier. So this is a pretty lucrative market and most of those fossils are pretty well understood. But sometimes you find something that's even rarer than that. And that's the case with the first fossils of Anica nycteris. It was found by private collectors, who then privately prepared that fossil, as opposed to having professional preparators in a museum prepare it. And what that means is that first fossil of Anica nycteris has some parts of it that are missing or slightly damaged, meaning that when researchers from the Royal Ontario Museum found out about this fossil, they weren't feeling confident in purchasing it simply because they didn't think there was enough there to really justify that purchase because of the damage. Now, this doesn't mean that the preparation is terrible. In fact, in most places where you see Onica nycteris casts, it is used preferentially over the holotype because the holotype is prepared in a very interesting way. And that's because the researchers from Royal Ontario Museum told the people who found Onica nycteris that if they found another bat like this to give them a call before preparing it. And so the researchers at the Royal Ontario Museum were able to get a solid slab of rock containing a bat fossil inside of it. And so this fossil went to the Royal Ontario Museum. And when the preparators there started to prepare it, started to scrape the rock away from the bone, what they realized is if they prepared it from the top, where the top part of the skull would be, that the entire skull was likely to fall apart. 
It didn't have a lot of interior strength, and so the rock was really helping to hold it all together. But if they flipped the entire slab over and started repairing it from the bottom, they could actually get a good look at at least the bottom part of the skull. And so that's what these preparators did. They scraped away the rock from the bottom of the skull, being able to show the bottom part of the mandible and then some of the internal parts of the bottom of the skull, including parts of the ear, and that will be important. And there were a lot of different features that helped researchers to understand the kind of bat that Anictonicturus was. And these include things like having claws on all of the fingers, which is a very good indicator that this is potentially the oldest diverging bat that we have a fossil of. And the phylogenetic research does also support that idea. Essentially, there's the main lineage that led to modern bats, but Anictonicturus is probably the first bat fossil that we have that diverged away from that lineage, which is unfortunate for it because that means it and its lineage probably went extinct, but it is really useful for understanding what bats were doing when they first started to evolve. In fact, other fossil bats from around the same time period, notably Paleochiropteryx from Germany and Echinoronycterus, which is also from the Green River Formation, show up much closer to this modern lineage than Onychonycterus does. So it really does seem like it's the oldest diverging bat. So Onychonycterus is very useful for understanding what bats were like when they first started to evolve. And some of that also goes down to its legs, which are much longer than those found in other bats. In fact, it's kind of at an intermediate area for the ratio of its arm length to its back leg length. And it kind of falls somewhere between volant animals, so bats, essentially in the modern day, and then also other animals that are still climbing in trees and have relatively short legs, but much longer arms. So something like a gibbon, which doesn't fly, but they get around pretty well in the trees. But arguably most importantly, parts of the inner ear were preserved. And what that means is researchers could see the expanded ear canal, and specifically the same kind of features that we do see in modern day echolocating bats. So the bats that fly around and hunt for other animals, as opposed to the more fruit eating bats. There are essentially two major ways to try and divide up bats into subgroups. The first has the megachiropterans and the microchiropterans and the megachiropterans are the larger bats, like the flying fox, which are mostly fruit eaters. Meanwhile, you have the microchiropterans, which use echolocation to hunt. This means that Onychonycterus was potentially one of the very first microchiropterans, and also that echolocation evolved very, very early in the bat evolutionary line, something that wasn't expected because echolocation is a pretty complex behavior for an animal to start to develop so quickly. And so there it is. Onychonycterus was one of the very first echolocating bats within the group Microchiroptera. At least that's what it is right now. And the reason I bring in that caveat is there's still a lot of debate among bat researchers on how to split up the bats. And the Megachiroptera and the Microchiroptera are kind of falling out of favor. Instead, researchers are looking at the idea of Yinterochiroptera and Yangochiroptera which would essentially just move the megabats, megachiropterans, into a separate smaller group that would also include some of the microbats, some of the small echolocating bats. This kind of change in the phylogeny of bats would mean that the megabats probably ancestrally had echolocation and then later lost it because they were eating on fruit and it's a lot easier to catch a fruit than it is to catch something like a fruit fly. And so while that does mix up some of our perceptions on what Onychonycterus would have been, it does also mean that it very likely did echolocate, because with both of these groups, both having members that do use echolocation, it means that echolocation probably does go all the way back to the very first bats, including animals like Onychonycterus. And so while this does kind of confuse whether Onychonycterus was one of these microchiropterans, or if we need to look at all of bat evolution a little more closely, it does mean that it was still probably a very early bat, because the fact that both of these two groups Interochiroptera and Yangochiroptera both have members that use echolocation, that means that the very first bats probably use echolocation, and that things like Onychonycterus are probably very close to that starting point for the bats. And so while Onychonycterus lived in states that we normally think of as being pretty cold, especially states like Wyoming and parts of Colorado, we need to also understand that the warmer environment that was present at the time was the cradle that bats evolved in and potentially part of the reason they became so successful is the world had just seen a mass extinction, specifically the KPG extinction, which had killed off the non-avian dinosaurs only about 15 million years earlier. And so a lot of its life was still diversifying and filling different niches. And we don't have such a luxury with our environment today. 
as we continue to see more warming, we need to look to the past so we can understand what kind of evolutionary pressures occurred on different groups during those time periods, so we can try and potentially better prepare for the future as more environmental changes occur. My wife wanted me to mention what she thinks is the best part of bat evolution, which is that they kind of show up out of nowhere. Like, we've done genetic studies, so we know kind of what animals they're related to, other mammals they're related to. But they also just kind of show up out of nowhere from some kind of tree-climbing ancestor that we have no idea what it looks like. Because, again, Anica nycteris is pretty much the oldest bat we have good fossils of, and it's already very clearly a bat. You're not sitting there like, ah, oh, it's transitioning to being a bat. It's just a bat. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. I know for a what the hell is it, this one was pretty clearly a bat from the beginning, but I wanted to try and pick some bookier things for uh, Halloween coming up. Keep in mind, if you do want to vote on these, you can join the Patreon. We're also putting up some of the videos that I'm doing in the field there, which my wife should be getting all linked together so we can get those out for the patrons soon. Yeah, it's been a year since we've started the what the hell is this series. Also, sorry for the kind of low quantity of videos this month. I've just been in the field a lot. A whole lot. <laughs> With that in mind, everyone, be safe, take care. You know, keep wearing your vax- keep wearing your vaccine. Um, you know, get your mask. And don't go extinct.